All right, thank you everyone for being here for uh, what is the second SLAM seminar of this uh, semester. So it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Caleb Wagner today, who's from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And he's going to talk about, uh, as you can see from his title, um, structures in confined active pneumatics. So this is, you, you could think of this as like uh, part as a, as a second active pneumatic talk in, in this semester, because we heard from Dr. Mike Norton, who I believe is a collaborator of Caleb in, in, in some of his works. So it'll be very exciting to continue with this theme. So Caleb is uh, uh, working with Professor Yush Grover, and he's part of this. Sorry, sorry. Uh, he's, he's part of this effort to uh, apply uh, to gain understanding of active pneumatic matter uh, from a dynamical systems theory perspective. His uh, collaborators other than uh, Piyush Grover also include Professor, Professor Jason Park, uh, also at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and Dr. Mike Nort Norton, who we heard from um, uh, last month. So uh, Caleb is broadly interested in the theory of non-equilibrium matter, including active matter and its implications for materials design and engineering. He holds a PhD uh, in physics from uh, Brandeis University, where he worked on the mathematics of non-equilibrium steady states in dilute active matter, where he wrote some uh, uh, papers on the mathematics of, the, of, of active Brownian particles and the type of phase separation they undergo, like uh, the motility induced phase separation, for example. So, uh, and he was advised by Professor uh, Aparna Bhaskaran there. So now he's working on a very different type of active matter from a different perspective. Uh, but uh, so over to you, Caleb, we'll be, uh, we are looking forward to hear from you. Alrighty, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So why don't I add a few things about me just for fun? So uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest. Um, I did my undergraduate in LA and then PhD in Boston at Brandeis. Um, so now I'm in Nebraska, so I've been all around the country. Um, dissertation is on mathematics of uh, non-equilibrium steady states in, uh, in active matter. The first 50 pages of the dissertation are open access, creative commons. So if you wanna use them for anything, you can. I actually don't know what you'd wanna use them for, but just, just in case. <laughs> um, over here on the right is my cat, Meow Meow. She is an expert on sitting in boxes, as you can see. Um, some miscellaneous hobbies and interests. Um, I like outdoor activities, hiking and skiing. Kind of, I acquired that interest growing up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm interested in computing hardware, like gaming computers and stuff like that. Um, I like reading, sci-fi especially. And I, I'm, an, I'm an active Wikipedia contributor. Um, I'm, I'm known for my contributions to math, physics, and uh, household appliances uh, to some extent. <laughs> So I have some fun with that. Um, of course, this talk is mostly about my research. So let's dive into that. So my research has pretty consistently been focused on active matter, both during my PhD and during my current postdoc. Um, so active matter refers to uh, materials where the uh, driven materials, where the, the driving enters at the level of the constituents. So you could imagine in your, in your mind, um, like self-propelled particles or particles equipped with tiny motors, something like that. So a lot of examples of active matter come from biology. So uh, schools of fish, flocks of birds, um, swarms of bacteria, and in the bottom right, I'm showing a, a snapshot of a human-made active matter system made of uh, microtubule bundles. And these are driven by uh, motor proteins that cause them to undergo an extensile motion. 
Um, and this is a kind of active pneumatic. And it's the, the type of active matter I'll be focusing on in this talk. Um, and so active pneumatics, like they're, this isn't the only kind of active pneumatic system out there. Um, this classification refers to the symmetry of the uh, particles and their, their driving forces. Um, so there are other kinds of active pneumatics, but um, for our purposes, I think this is a nice, nice example to have in mind as we move through things. Okay, so uh, from a theoretical point of view, we're going to take a continuum uh, level description um, as opposed to, to particle based, which one can also do. Um, so our, uh, our continuum model is built out of two fields. Uh, one is a second rank, rank tensor called Q, and this quantifies the degree of uh, pneumatic alignment. Um, and then V is just the, the flow velocity. Um, and these, these fields obey some set of hydrodynamic equations, the details of which are not too important for our purposes, um, but I do wanna highlight some features. So basically the flow velocity will follow some sort of um, Navier-Stokes or Stokes equation where there's an active stress term uh, related to the, uh, the Q tensor field in some way. And this, uh, this is a term that drives the flow. Um, and then Q itself uh, is driven by uh, convection with, with uh, respect to V uh, and also some kind of flow alignment usually that's uh, embodied in this S term. Um, and there's some other features of the dynamics that I, I don't wanna get, get into in detail. And, and actually it's, it's an ongoing program of research to figure out the best set of equations to use and what parameters to use. And I, I don't know that the community has settled on a final answer yet. Um, fortunately for us, um, in, in relation to, to my work, um, our methods and results don't depend too sensitively on the details of the equations. Um, it, it matters more that we get like the symmetries right. Um, the symmetries we'll see play a pretty big role in, uh, in, in our results. Um, and, and also to some extent, we're introducing new techniques and a new framework. Um, so, you know, we can fine tune it in relation to uh, experiments uh, later on. Um, and, and actually in, in that connection, you know, if you're not interested in active pneumatics per se, um, you could still substitute your favorite hydrodynamic equations or PDEs in for these ones. And uh, some of the methods and concepts I'll be talking about will, uh, would transfer over to uh, some you know, other physical contexts. Okay, so uh, active matter does a lot of interesting stuff in confinement. And as like a first pass uh, at trying to understand the, the effects of confinement, we're gonna look at a very simple channel geometry, uh, which is sketch, sketched out here. Um, so we have walls at the top and bottom of the channel and then periodic boundary conditions in X. Uh, and there's been a lot of interesting work on this geometry, a lot of interesting phenomenology. I'll uh, try to highlight uh, a few of the most, uh, most relevant flow phenomenon, um, but there's, you know, there's more there that I, I don't have time to talk about. Um, okay, so this is a good, a good place to start our, uh, start our work. Um, okay, so just a few example flow states. Uh, so, oops. So first of all, uh, in these, uh, this, this top one isn't a video, it's a static uh, figure. The bottom one is a video. 
Um, and both of these, the arrows denote the flow velocity and the color gradient is the vorticity. Um, so th on, the, on the top is this steady unidirectional flow that uh, appears and, and is stable at relatively low levels of activity. Um, and then for high enough activity, eventually you go into this state of uh, so-called active turbulence where you have this disordered distribution of, of vortices and you know, it kind of looks like spatiotemporal chaos. Um, but a lot of interesting stuff happens in between these, these limits. Um, so it's been known for a while now that you, you get these very non-trivial dynamical uh, steady states in this channel geometry. Um, so in, in these videos, the, the, top, uh, the top plot shows the director field. Uh, those are the rods and the color gradient is the order parameter. Um, and on the bottom is again, the velocity field and the vorticity. And what we see is that these, um, so the, the blue regions are, uh, are defects in the uh, pneumatic director field. And we see that they, they undergo this kind of uh, braiding motion that's been called a, a dancing. Uh, dancing behavior. So these, uh, these are called dancing disclinations. Um, and then in the velocity field has these uh, regular vortices. Um, and we, we can have different numbers of them. Uh, both three and fourfold vortices happen to be stable at this set of parameters. Um, okay, so that's an example of the kind of non-trivial flow behavior that's observed. Um, kind of zooming out a little bit, uh, I just want to summarize uh, the, the main flow regimes. Um, so for, for very low activity, you just have zero flow. Um, there aren't any, any defects in your uh, director field. Nothing interesting is happening. Um, as activity increases, you uh, you break a, a symmetry and go into either a right or left flowing uh, unidirectional state, um, but there still aren't any defects. Um, increasing activity further, eventually you do nucleate defects and they, they organize into this dancing uh, pattern I, I just showed you. Um, and in between here, there may be some traveling waves depending on the parameters you're using. Um, but for our simulations, we've mostly seen the, the uh, uh, dancing disclinations. Um, and then eventually you go into the state of active turbulence. Um, and there's, you know, there are some nice uh, physical explanations for why we get these flow transitions. And it's, it's basically related to a balance between um, the active stresses and the tendency of the pneumatic to uh, align itself. Um, and as activity increases, you eventually get these finite wavelength instabilities that give rise to these non-trivial structures. So this is a very nice picture. Um, what I wanna do is suggest that there's, there's even more to discover and talk about here. And to motivate that, I wanna throw a couple of metaphorical wrenches. Um, things that we observe, but maybe aren't explained by the picture I just, I just showed you. Okay, so wrench number one. Um, here's this giant mosaic figure uh, consisting of 169 stationary or periodic solutions to these active pneumatic equations. Um, so most of these are actually periodic solutions, like kind of like the dancing disclinations, though they, they might have different uh, morphology as you can see, as you can see here. I wanted to animate all of these, but it kind of crashed my computer. So I'll, I'll probably have to come back to that one later, but most of these are dynamical. Um, 
There was a question in the chat uh, from Ricardo Larry about how do traveling waves arise from the equations of active pneumatics? Um, I don't know if I could give a nice physical picture on the spot. Um, I've probably been like thinking in too, too much in mathematical terms uh, to, to be able to do that on the spot. Um, but yeah, I guess if you, if you like, if you linearize your dynamics around this unidirectional laminar state, then you do get finite wavelength instabilities that correspond to, they, they may correspond to traveling waves. So you'll have like, I don't know, let's say, let's say you have five unstable directions, um, each one of which will have a different wavelength. And that, those would give rise to like, you know, n fold traveling waves um, with like n undulations in the channel. So that's probably the, the best explanation I can give on the spot. Uh, maybe we could talk about it more later if you're interested. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so the, the punchline here is that all of these solutions exist at a single turbulent parameter set, and they're all dynamically unstable. Now, this may, like, you can kind of rationalize this mathematically. Um, the, these kinds of invariant sets of the uh, PDEs would, would have to arise as like roots of some really high dimensional not a system of nonlinear algebraic equations. Um, so, so you might think like, okay, um, nonlinear algebraic equations may have lots of non-trivial uh, solutions and some really complicated uh, geometric structure. Um, and if someone had told me that a few years ago, I, you know, my response probably would have been like, like, yeah, um, I, I guess, uh, but it, and maybe the conversation would have progressed from there, but in any case, at least for me, this wasn't really how I would think about nonlinear hydrodynamic PDEs. Um, I'd more be thinking about like, what are the attractors? Um, what, you know, if we're in a state of turbulence, can we give a statistical description to the precise time dependence? Um, so this mosaic suggests that there's, there's some intrinsic aspect of these PDEs that maybe we're missing. Um, that's not a complete picture because even if these solutions exist, uh, I haven't shown, I haven't convinced you that they're dynamically relevant. They, you know, Maybe they're just intellectual curiosities. Are they all distinct in the braid sense? Uh, some of them are pretty similar, actually. So there, there are like, for example, I, I've seen a, a few instances of, let's say, a fourfold dancing disclinations, but with the dancing pattern slightly deformed maybe, or some symmetry broken. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, the, the braiding behavior um, is, yeah, it, it's shared by more than one of uh, these invariant solutions. Yeah, that's really so, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so there, there are uh, people thinking more about that particular aspect. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so the, the the lead in I was I was giving for uh, the wrench wrench number two is that uh, we we need to know that these solutions are actually like physically relevant, and to so I want to argue that they they are or they can be, and to do so I want to shift to a uh, phase space visualization. So instead of looking at these fields in real space, um, I'm going to look at a uh, a three D uh, abstract phase space where the axes are these uh, channel average quantities. 
So uh, average U, this is the average flow in the streamwise direction. Average V squared is sort of like the average deviation from a, a one dimensional flow. Average of Q11 is sort of like the average value of Q11, I guess. <laughs> Um, but anyway, these, these give us like a, a nice uh, low dimensional vis visualization. Okay, now I wanna show you a video and I'm gonna show some stills of this later. So if the video doesn't render very well, that's okay. Um, and this one is actually intended to look kind of obscure. Um, I'll show a cleaner version in a second. But what's happening here is I've run a turbulent simulation for a long time. And I'll explain the colors in a moment, but what, what I noticed and what anyone would notice, I think, is if you look closely enough, um, the, the system spends some time concentrated in this center area, right around where this red loop is. Um, and that's actually where a, a periodic orbit is located, um, like, like one of the ones I showed you before. Um, but on both sides of that uh, residence time near this periodic orbit, the system is doing all kinds of chaotic maneuvering. Um, so <clears throat> the blue dash line is the trajectory before this near pass. Um, and then the green is the trajectory after. So, you know, basically you can't tell between before and after. Um, it looks pretty much like uh, turbulence. So uh, zooming in, just to give you a better picture. So what's happening is we're, we're spiraling in near, like almost on top of this periodic orbit um, and spending some time there before shooting off along this green trajectory. And uh, what a key point here is that this, this periodic orbit is actually dynamically unstable. Um, and the, the whole, the system as a whole is, is turbulent. So this is something very non-trivial. It's not like we're going into an attractor. Um, it's, it's like somehow we're, we're getting very close to an unstable structure, which, which should be kind of surprising. Okay, so these uh, still images just kind of summarize the points I made. Um, they may be a little more clear to visualize. Um, and the, the key takeaway here is that we have sustained turbulence, and yet we have near passes to this periodic solution. And what's more, and I, I didn't say this yet, but these are recurrent near passes. If I ran the simulation for another, I mean, I haven't given the simulation time units, but you know, run it for a while longer, um, eventually it would do this thing again. Um, after wandering around chaotically for a long time. Um, so, so that's kind of surprising. And it's, it's worth mentioning too that I haven't done a whole lot of fine tuning here. I did pick a nice example. There are some not so nice examples. There are some simulations where you don't see something like this. Um, but I also didn't do any crazy cherry picking. Um, basically, if you run enough turbulent simulations, like you will see stuff like this happen. It's not totally uh, uncommon. Okay, so these uh, two wrenches should hopefully suggest that there's, there's something missing in the picture we had before. And to, to figure out what's missing, um, I wanna introduce a new or uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of new for physics, I think. Um, I want to introduce a, a framework from which we can try to understand these, these behaviors. So uh, this is a dynamical systems approach where we, we basically take our hydrodynamic equations and we just shift our perspective and we recognize them as a, a deterministic dynamical system in an abstract sense. Um, and deterministic here is, is a key word. So we're, we're kind of purposefully avoiding a statistical description 
and and seeing what can be gained by uh, by taking that different route, the deterministic route. Um, so because these are PDEs, this uh, time evolution is in an infinite dimensional phase space of all possible Q and V. So it's like a functional space. Um, nevertheless, we can still use low, di low dimensional dynamical systems as an analog. So many of you have probably <clears throat> heard of the Lorentz system, which is a, a three dimensional system. There's a three coupled ODEs um, that exhibit some really non-trivial behavior and, and chaos. Um, so uh, basically I wanna argue that some of the, and actually this is on my, my next slide. So uh, key concepts carry over from low dimensional systems and can really give us some deep insight into these uh, high dimensional PDE systems. So uh, number one, uh, we, we do have invariant sets. We have equilibria, we have periodic orbits. Um, you, you may hear me call these exact solutions imprecisely. Um, it's probably better to call them invariant sets. Um, but, but nevertheless, we, you know, we get these kinds of things for PDEs um, generically. Uh, we also can do a linear stability analysis uh, like we would for, I don't know, classical mechanics, um, low dimensional particle-based systems. Um, we can also talk about bifurcations. Uh, the, the basic bifurcations you get in low dimensional systems also carry over. And we can use these bifurcations to understand changes in stability of our invariant solutions um, and also situations where solutions are created or destroyed. Um, and finally, this gives us a template for deterministic chaos. And basically we wanna make this connection that turbulence is spatio-temporal chaos, um, which I think is a pretty, it's a pretty accurate assessment. Um, and I wanna make the case that it's, it's a useful one as well. Okay, so we can use this, uh, we can use these concepts to, to make sense of the phenomenology I, I showed you before. So when we pass from one flow regime into another, we, our, our system is basically going through a bifurcation. So um, we could either have, we're actually, in most cases, we probably have both of these things happening. We'll have an unstable invariant set becoming stable. Um, and then we may also have some invariant sets being created or destroyed. So as an example, um, the transition from zero flow to the right and left flowing laminar states, um, it could, so I actually don't know if this is always the case. I haven't checked rigorously, but um, it's, it's likely to be a pitchfork bifurcation where you start with a single stable equilibrium and then it uh, bifurcates becomes, so the original equilibrium becomes unstable and then you get two new ones that are these uh, symmetry breaking right and left flowing uh, states and, and they're stable. So this would manifest as a uh, transition from one flow regime to another. Um, we could have some more complex bifurcations like a, like a hop bifurcation. So here we'd go from a stable equilibrium uh, to an unstable equilibrium plus a stable periodic orbit. So this could explain the emergence of the dancing disclination state. Um, so this, this is like an alternate way of understanding these, these various uh, flow regimes. Okay, well, what about turbulence? So this is much more complicated, but the basic mechanisms are understood by which a system can develop chaos. Um, one, one well-known scenario is this uh, Rula Takin's new house scenario. Um, I don't know if this is what happens for active pneumatics. I, I kind of suspect it does, but I really don't have any rigorous basis for that. Um, but basically you, you go through this 
sequence of transitions that at least at first looks similar to what, what uh, we've seen for active pneumatics. Um, you start with some equilibrium or traveling wave. <clears throat> um, you have a hopped bifurcation to limit cycle. Uh, you have a Nymark Sacker bifurcation to a, a quasi periodic set. So this is like a two torus. Um, and then some more exotic stuff happens and you get a three torus. And apparently the three torus is enough to nucleate um, chaotic sets. So this is where you, you'll start seeing like strange attractors. And then from there, things just become more chaotic and more turbulent. Um, so we can use this dyna dynamical systems approach to, to also understand uh, things like turbulence. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the torus here since this is a little abstract. So rather than a, a periodic system, which we can sort of watch cycling through some motions that we can think of as a circle, this is a system that is cycling through a two parameter set of motions that it keeps coming back through? Yeah. <clears throat> so you could imagine your trajectory is confined to the surface of a torus. And, and that's, that's like the invariant set. Um, so if you plotted it in the 3D phase space, the trajectory would be, it, it would be tracing out the surface of a, of a torus. Whereas the limit cycle would be like a single loop. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I probably like the more concrete way of thinking of it is that you have two frequencies. If you did a you know, Fourier mode decomposition of your time series, you just see two frequencies. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. But they, they are kind of, they, they are more difficult to visualize and compute. So, the, the torus I've seen for active pneumatics happens to be stable. Um, otherwise, I, I wouldn't, like, it would be very difficult to discover. Um, and yeah, three torus, I don't know. Definitely, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not that you're missing some conceptual uh, ingredient here. Like, this is, these things are hard to visualize, I think. Um, but it's you're suggesting this as the route from trivial periodicity to total chaos. Yeah, so this this has been demonstrated as a possible route from periodicity to chaos. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know if this is what happens for active pneumatics. It's it's kind of my conjecture. There there are other routes to chaos. Um, so, so I don't know, maybe someone will figure it out in the future, it'd be kind of so there's, a, there's a comment and a question in the chat. So Piyush Grover says that these two frequencies are incommensurate. And oh, uh, yeah. Eldad Afik is asking, um, for the laminar flow to be viewed as a pitch fork, shouldn't we have that the zero flow case is an unstable fixed point of the, of the weakly driven case? Unstable. Uh, I don't, well, you can have pitchforks in different directions. Um, I don't think I messed up the stability labels, did I? So you, it starts out stable, the zero flow, and then it bifurcates and becomes unstable. And then the right and left flowing ones are stable uh, size of the pitchfork. Um, if I got something wrong, it's, you know, someone can, can point it out. Um, so, sorry, this might, might be my misunderstanding of, of uh, the definition here. Um, but is the, um, for a pitchfork, shouldn't the non-flow solution remain a fixed point? If you want oh. to call it a pitchfork? Is it a oh, solution, yeah. is it a steady state? Yeah, I understand yeah, that it's not it's unstable, but is it a, is it a fixed point at all? It is. It is. Yeah. Did, yeah. Let me. Uh... If this is a, a side point, maybe it's it's not worth uh, the time of everyone for this. It's just I, I don't see how this comes from from the equation that 
under weak forcing you get that zero flow is a solution of uh, is a steady state solution oh oh you mean like a stable one not a stable you, oh i mean as far as i understand all we need is that the steady state that is a zero time derivative uh so we'll get that this is a fixed zero, zero flow would be a fixed point at non-zero forcing uh-huh right this yeah. it doesn't need to be stable it just needs to be a fixed point yeah it, it is a fixed point yeah so even with non-zero activity it's still a fixed point the forcing is not like uh, external term right the forcing is uh, inside the uh, uh alpha multiplying q and all that so you can get it you can still uh, yeah i guess the the tendency of the of the pneumatic to align itself would would tend to suppress like uh so the forcing may be trying to take it out of the zero flow but the restoring force of the pneumatic would keep it keep it there yes uh that that may be one a way to think about it okay yeah, yeah. thank you yeah, yeah physically i maybe haven't <laughs> put in all the conceptual explanations um but but yeah, I, I think this is this should be uh, an accurate picture. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if if we're if we're good, then we'll we'll keep going. Um, okay. So question: uh, What happens to the unstable invariant sets? So as we go through a bifurcation, we we retain um the unstable solutions i mean per the example we just talked about the zero flow solution will still exist it'll just be unstable so so where do these solutions go i mean like in an abstract like what do they do um and this is something i had never really thought about before uh i kind of implicitly assumed once something became unstable, it like effectively ceased to exist. Um, but if you if you think about it, then you you do have to realize like, yeah, you would get more and more unstable invariant sets being created. And uh, you might get some very complicated uh, bifurcation sequences happening behind the scenes. So this this figure is from this uh, paper on 2D Kolmogorov turbulence. And it's kind of like I wanted to show it just to illustrate how complex these bifurcation sequences sequences can become. Um, so each each colored curve here is a uh, solution branch, um, some of which like there are some points on here labeled with open circles, I believe, where the branch couldn't be continued anymore numerically, like the algorithm just failed. Um, and even then, you still get this huge proliferation of tangles of these uh, unstable solutions. Um, so this is kind of fascinating that this is happening behind the scenes. Um, as, a, as a fun side note, <laughs> these bifurcation sequences can become incredibly complex. Um, so, so don't, don't think that this is something I or someone else could figure out in detail. Um, and I'll get to this point in a moment that that's actually okay. But I, I wanted to show this, uh, this excerpt from this book just for fun. So these don't worry about what the pictures mean. I just wanted to show them cause they look kind of cool. Um, but this, this paragraph here reads. So um, these structures imply the existence of an infinite number of periodic orbits. Closed invariant curves corresponding to limit cycles lose their smoothness and are destroyed, almost colliding, quote unquote, with the saddle period four cycle. Individual bifurcation sequences become dependence on beta and involve an infinite number of bifurcations. The complete details are likely to remain unknown forever. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of a, a fun, a fun thing to read. Um, but, but the takeaway 
from from this this slide there's just two points one is that we we get these this prolifer pr proliferation of unstable sets um, and the second one is that we actually don't need to know exactly where they all came from um, we we also don't need to know all of them in a lot of cases there's going to be an infinite number anyway um, and the next few slides i i hope will uh, illustrate why that is the case, why we don't need to know all these details. Okay, so the key premise of this dynamical systems approach, which I'm just gonna put out there and you can uh, chew on it, see if it makes sense, and we'll, we'll uh, go on to talk about its implications. So the claim is that unstable invariant sets provide a scaffolding for global dynamics. So this is a geometric view of the PDE dynamics. Um, we're no longer thinking about single trajectories. Instead, we're thinking about a flow map on a phase space. Um, and the geometry of the phase space characterizes the, the global dynamics of the PDE. So this, Geometric viewpoint goes all the way back to Poincaré, um, who called, called it a, a breach into a domain hitherto reputed un, unreachable. Um, so the breach here is that we're using these invariant sets to try to understand this seemingly impossible problem of, of uh, nonlinear PDE dynamics. Um, these are very hard problems. Uh, in more modern times, there's been work on uh, decomposing chaotic sets into cycles. Um, so very, very roughly mathematically, you, you might say that a chaotic set is a union of an infinite number of periodic orbits. Um, so this conjecture of, of Poincaré uh, can be made concrete in, in some, some simple cases. Um, and it's suggesting for the active pneumatics as well, we should try to decompose our dynamics in terms of some, some uh, selection of invariant sets. Okay, so that's, that's the motivation. Um, it's okay if the details don't stick in this aspect. Um, the main takeaway is that unstable structures matter. Okay, so I wanna give some more concrete language to those ideas. Uh, so in our current work, we're using this term exact coherent structure. Um, and this, this is just saying, um, so our, uh, our invariant sets, we're, we're just calling exact coherent structures. Um, and we're saying that uh, not only is the phase space geometry governed by these sets, um, but it's also described by their stable and unstable manifolds. Um, and these, these are manifolds that permeate the global phase space and tell you how uh, trajectories either converge to or diverge from in ECS. Um, so the stable manifold is the set of all trajectories that converge to an ECS as T goes to plus infinity. Um, the unstable manifold is the set that converges as T goes to minus infinity. So um, this is, we're, we're kind of, we're trying to build a network that spans the, the phase space. Um, and the, the ECS and their manifolds are the, the, um, you know, the nodes and the filaments of this network. Okay, so as a concrete visualization, um, we can look at just a 1D uh, dynamical system, a uh, particle and a, and a potential. Um, here we have, three fixed points. Uh, one is an unstable energy maximum, two are stable energy minima. Um, and the, uh, so the stable and unstable manifolds are these special trajectories. Make sure, I don't know if you can see a pointer at all. Um, <laughs> here we go. So uh, th these are loops that um, have, the exact energy of this uh, energy maximum. So they, your, your particle gets perturbed off the hill um, and, and uh, rolls down up the other side. 
and then and then comes back. Um, and so so this is a just a simple visualization of these of these manifolds. Um, the other point I want to make is that even though this fixed point is unstable, I don't think you would say that it doesn't matter. I mean, you you can definitely tell that it's there just looking from a time series, um, especially if your particle has an energy kind of close to its energy. Um, you're going to obviously see that it's going close to some object, um, some invariant set and slowing down. Um, so, so hopefully this kind of uh, supports my, my claim that unstable structures matter. Uh, so for periodic orbits, the picture is a little harder to visualize um, because we have this extra dimension along the orbit itself. So basically the stable and unstable manifolds become tubes. Um, and, well, actually that's, that's not quite right. So if, if your system is uh, low dimensional, like this example here, um, then they form these, these uh, nice tubes that you can visualize. In general, these could be very high dimensional objects. Um, and that's, it is a visualization challenge. Um, but there are some simple cases. I'll try to show another example later where you can actually see these manifolds as tubes in the phase space. And this kind of looks like what's happening uh, for this near pass I showed before to this periodic orbit. Um, I actually haven't looked at the, the details of this, but it, it kind of looks like you're spiraling in on a tube-like stable manifold, and then you're leaving in some other uh, unstable direction. Um, and you know, conceptually, this has to be what's, what's happening, independent of the exact details of how things look. Okay, so takeaways so far. Um, the unstable ECS matter, they shape trajectories. Um, moreover, their stable and unstable manifolds are global objects that lead to and, and away from them. So they connect them across phase space. Um, if these stable and unstable manifolds intersect, then you can enable transitions um, through, through phase space. So for example, if you could perturb your system starting from ECS1 onto its unstable manifold, um, then you could try to converge it to ECS2 on uh, that one stable manifold. Um, so this is, kind of, this is a motivation behind uh, using this picture for uh, transport and, and control. Okay, so uh, try, to, try to get through uh, as much as I can in the in the time left. So uh, we have done a proof of principle of this approach in uh, pre-turbulent active pneumatic channel flow. So recall the setup <clears throat> we had previously. Um, we will focus on this parameter set that's not quite all the way to turbulence. Uh, we see more uh, more of these vortex solutions. Um, but interestingly, we actually do see some we see at least one chaotic set. Um, so this is kind of a mixed part of the, the phase diagram. Um, so some ECS, these, sorry, these ones on the top, I showed you before. Um, what I wanna add now is that we also have these K vortex analogs. Um, th these are stills, they're not videos, but um, they're, they're variations on these top ones, but with, uh, uh, more, yeah, I guess, yeah, there's no fewer than, than three, but uh, with, with larger number of vortices. Um, another interesting one is what I'm gonna call RPOU. Uh, and this is a solution that goes very close to this laminar unidirectional state, uh, but then it destabilizes and nucleates these defects and they shoot across the channel. Um, and then uh, I could, well, the video won't restart with the pointer, um, but they, they eventually uh, merge and annihilate and you, you go back to this uh, unidirectional state. Um, and we also have K-fold analogs of these. 
Um, so this, these would represent like these finite wavelength instabilities uh, we talked about before. Um, and, and incidentally, the K equals 10 analog is the traveling wave, um, just kind of coincidentally. Okay, so in phase space, here's what these look like. Um, so these uh, vortex lattice solutions, dancing disclination solutions, um, some of them are in this uh, plane right here, these big loops. Um, and they're, so because they're periodic orbits, they have zero net flow. Um, so they're all, all concentrated there. Um, we have these other vortex lattice solutions um, that are drifting. So these are uh, called rolling vortices. Um, so let me switch out of the pointer. Um, yeah. So this is like a RPO 4A, 4C. Those are rolling vortices. Um, this black tangle is actually a chaotic attractor. Um, and finally, this uni here, this black square uh, or cube, uh, that's this unidirectional equilibrium. And these big loops are these RPOUs that cycle between this uh, almost, uni almost unidirectional flow and this uh, defect creation and annihilation. Um, okay, so that's, that's an alternate visualization um, in addition to the real space version I showed you. Um, another representation is in terms of a directed graph. So here, the ECS I showed you before are nodes, and the edges are uh, what are called heteroclinic connections. So these are the trajectories that depart on the unstable manifold of one ECS and converge onto the stable manifold of a, of a second one. Um, so the, the colored arrows highlighted here are some explicit examples of multi-step connections that, that we verified in simulations. Um, so I'll show a picture of a couple of these in a moment. Um, oh yeah, one other thing I didn't mention yet. We actually have three coexisting attractors. Uh, two of them are these vortex lattice dancing disclination solutions. Um, and then that's these ones right here. And then we also have this chaotic attractor. So we have chaos coexisting with coherent motion. It's kind of kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, so the punchline here is that using this directed graph representation, we can chain together these, these connecting orbits to maneuver ourselves throughout phase space. Um, so what, what the next slide shows is the uh, connection between PO3A and RPO3A. And this turns out to be precisely um, one of these, these uh, tube-like uh, unstable manifolds. Um, and that's because this unstable three vortex PO only has one unstable direction. Um, so this is like a very simple case where we can visualize it directly. A um, little more non-trivial and interesting is to uh, show the, the phase space representation of those colored arrows from before. Um, so, so these are the multi-step connections from one ECS to another. So the red orbit here starts from this equilibrium, this black star, um, goes into a uh, seven, yeah, it's a sevenfold periodic orbit switches to a threefold periodic orbit, and then finally goes along this uh, un unstable manifold I showed before and lands in this, this blue three vortex uh, solution. Um, the green trajectory also leaves from the same equilibrium. Uh, it kind of goes near this blue PO with uh, eight vortices, and then it, it shoots off way out here 
to one of these RPOUs that uh, cycles between the unidirectional and the, the defect, the, uh, the state with the defects. Um, and from there, it wanders around and goes into this uh, fourfold vortex lattice. So even though these two trajectories start out in the same place, because they're given different perturbations, they go to com completely different regions of phase space. And realizing these connections was really only possible because of this graph structure. Otherwise, it would be really hard to figure out the right perturbations that would send it where you want it to. Um, okay, so I think we've ended up okay on time, probably. Um, some ideas for future work. Um, the stuff I've showed you has been, you know, pretty like we're calculating exact solutions and making nice figures and everything. But one has to wonder, like, could you also do this in a more data driven way? where maybe you don't calculate the exact ECS or make figures for all of them, but somehow you still uh, enhance your algorithms using the, uh, the information contained in them. Um, that probably sounded very vague. I, <laughs> I, I think there's, there's some potential there to use a data-driven framework. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about that more if that sounds interesting to you. Um, control theory is something I didn't talk about much at all. Um, apologies to Piyush because that's, that's his thing. Um, so I'm sure he'll be doing some cool stuff with that in the future. Uh, other physical systems, I don't know, just throw that one out there for fun. Um, in, in any case, uh, one thing that's currently in progress is uh, different geometries. So we've started looking at um, this uh, annulus geometry. And you know, there's some, some interesting stuff happening there. Okay, so that, that about does it. Um, here are the people who have been involved with this work besides me. Um, they've been really great to work with. And here is contact information, uh, our paper, if you're interested, and uh, DOE funding and acknowledgement. So. Yeah, there you go. All right, thank you, Caleb, so much for this presentation. So this is the time when we all virtually applaud for you. And uh, so what we usually do at this time is we transition into a discussion and question and answer without a recording. So in case, uh, so this is to encourage more informality. So uh, please feel free to speak up or raise your hand. Uh, if you <clears throat> have any questions or you want to discuss something further, and thank you, Caleb.